actually I was 13 years old that I went to that camp. So my my dad sent me to the camp and he, he, he loves to tell people this. He said it was not out of inspiration that I wanted Adam to be great. It was out of desperation <laughs> okay. to make sure that at least he won't end up in jail. You're watching our Hatch and Hustle podcast where I interview Adam Koo. Adam Koo first shot to fame after becoming a self-made millionaire at 26. While most of us might know him for his I Am Gifted So Are You series of books in school camps, his work extends far beyond education. Join us as we learn a bit more about the serial entrepreneur's journey. So Adam, describe who you are and what you do in one sentence. Okay, so I'll say that number one, I'm an investor now, um, entrepreneur and a teacher. Adam, what are three words that you often hear people describing you as? Funny. <laughs> so yeah, when I teach my classes, people always say that I make them laugh and they learn better, right? The other thing would be, yeah, you know, innovative, I always create new stuff. And um, yeah, I'm also known as a very family kind of person. I see. Uh, so tell me a bit about your businesses because people will know you, you know, depending on the type of life stage they are in. Yeah. And you've done many different things in your life. Yeah. How would you describe your businesses today? So it's all about education, right? Empowering people with knowledge and skills. So uh, the holding company is Adam Koo Learning Technologies Group. And within that, we've got three separate brands. We've got the Growth Catalyst, which does corporate training and professional development training for corporate people. Second would be known as the Activate brand, uh, which is all the youth training, uh, study skills, leadership skills and all that. And the third is all the financial courses and financial programs. That's under Piranha Profits. Of these three sub brands, right? Which brand is the most profitable? The most profitable is, is the finance business. Uh, in fact, 90% uh, of our profits is from the finance business. The youth business, interestingly enough, employs the most staff. We train the most people, but the least profitable, right? So I always you know, tell people that uh, if we were in it uh, just for the money, uh, then we would just do the finance thing, right? In fact, a lot of uh, people who are my friends who are VCs, venture capitalists, they say, why are you running the, the youth business, right? Just get rid of it, just focus on finance business. But, We'll never do that, all right? Because the youth business is where we really impact people's lives. And although it's not that profitable, right? But it helps a lot of people. Like, so do you still work very closely with government, with the government and MOE? Ministry of Education is our biggest uh, client, if you will, in the youth business. So we train a lot of the students and the teachers in the schools in Singapore. Yeah, I think if I'm not wrong, close to one in three students in secondary and primary schools, they have attended one of our courses, whether it's the outdoor adventure learning, study skills course, enrichment course. Tell us about your corporate training arm. So the corporate training arm is run by this guy called Jeremy, right? And our main program is called Scaling Up, where we actually help companies to scale up their revenue. So companies that typically we work with are a revenue between five to 10 million, right? And then we help them to scale up to 50, uh, 80, even 100 million dollars. Right, helping them to work on their cash flow, their marketing, their staffing and all that. So not many people might know, but your father also ran a successful business. He was an entrepreneur himself. He ran an ad agency right, for over 30 years. right? Yeah. And I also see that you've publicly posted uh, very positively about your father. Yeah. Right? So can you share with us some life lessons? So Because not everyone has the privilege of having an entrepreneur as a father. Yeah. I think that the main thing I took from him as a business, uh, as an entrepreneur is how he managed people. So he's someone who really empowered his staff. He was not like a micromanager and he hired people to do this, do that. He lets people do what they want, but he hires great people. And his philosophy has always been, if you hire a great manager, you should not have to manage him. If you have to manage them, something's wrong with them, right? So that's how I've run my business from day one, where I would say that my team are actually empowered, right? They, so it's my management team. They hire the people they look at their pay raises, they train the people. I don't get involved in that at all, right? So because my people feel very empowered, they feel that it's their business, uh, they work extremely hard. In fact, the joke is this. So like we have got metrics where we measure our sales and things like that, right? So when our sales are not up to par, my staff get more upset than me. They're like, hey, you know. So it's good when your staff get more upset than you, 
when you don't hit certain targets, right? It's like yeah. they have full ownership, but the only way that they have ownership is they have to have authority and responsibility of the business. Yeah, absolutely. Right. If not, you're never going to feel ownership of Correct. it. So apart from your father, you know, I'm sure that you also know many other entrepreneurs. If you were to try and identify a pattern that all these entrepreneurs have that made them successful, what do you think are some qualities? Okay, I, I would share this. Uh, I have found that every successful business needs four personalities. Okay, sometimes the four personalities can be found in one person, but very rare. But sometimes you need these four personalities to be split between several partners. So, so let me explain what I mean, right? So the first in any business is you need what we call a creator, someone with the big idea, the vision to inspire people. Like Apple is the Steve Jobs, right? That, that's the visionary, right? But can he actually do programming? Can he actually build a computer? No. So you need the second personality, which is called the specialist. The third personality you need is a manager, <clears throat> someone who puts everything in order, manages the staff, and executes. I am a terrible manager. I can come up with a very good idea, I'm very bad at implementation. That's why I knew I needed a partner. Uh, his name is Patrick, he's my partner from day one, he's also the group CEO. So without him, the business wouldn't be here because he manages, he puts everything into place. And the fourth personality you need is a deal maker, someone who likes networking, making connections and that. And honestly, I'm also not very good at that. So Patrick is the manager, he's the deal maker, I'm the creator, and in certain parts of the business, I'm the specialist as well because I'm the guy teaching. But we also have a lot of other specialists. So what I find is that to build a business, you have to recognize what are your strengths, all right? Like you may find that you are a manager, but you're not a very good creator. Then you have to find a partner who's a creator, right? Or you are a creator, you're a manager, but you are not good at networking. You're not good at deal making. Then you have to find a deal maker. And only when you've got the four personalities, then your business can be very successful. I struggle a lot with the management aspect myself because I'm not the manager yeah. type of person as well. I'm more of the, the vision and the product, I guess, similar to yourself. Yeah. You know, what would you be your advice? How did you go and find Patrick, for example? If someone wants to go and start a new company, how do they find their other half? That's really tough. And I would say I'm really very lucky. You know? So I found Patrick because we were both in NUS together and we were both in the same project teams. And we were in several project teams. And what happened was back in NUS, in a project team, you always have some friends who are very hardworking and some that don't do any work, right? Yeah. And it so happened that in the team we were in, five of us, me and Pat were the only ones who did the work. The other three like didn't do anything. So that's when I found out that this guy can do work, right? And we were in several teams together and we both did all the work, right? And that's when I also ran my event management business. It's a mobile disco company, which I invited him to join me. Mm. So that's how we really got to know each other. And so I was very lucky that I, you know, even before we started this Adam Cool Learning Technologies Group, we worked together for many years in school, in my early ventures. And we have, we have never quarreled uh, after being in this company for now uh, 21 years. So university and school is actually an amazing hunting ground to amazing find ground. That's right. potential yeah. business partners in life later. Yeah, and that's when you find the most authentic friends, not just business partners, the most authentic friends are the ones you find in school before you start working. Because once you start working, there's always an agenda, right? When you yeah. meet people, or oh, you know, I want something from him and that. But school, there's like no agenda. I just want to be friends. So you want friendship people. as well, not just a business yeah, partner. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, looking at Patrick and the qualities he has, mm. right, what are some other qualities that maybe you would notice in other entrepreneurs where you would see them and then, you know, maybe there's someone going for your course and you'd say, ah, this guy would probably make it. To be a successful entrepreneur is not so much the intellectual part. Mm. Of course, you must have some brains. Okay, yeah. you must have a minimum amount of brains, which is not a lot, just common sense. I would say you just need common sense, right? But the most important quality is the temperamental quality, which is optimism. You must be someone who's very optimistic, that when everything goes wrong, you must be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel, that if I keep going, uh, I'll get there, right? You must have the optimism. Second is the resilience, because you and I know that whatever you do in life, even in business, before you get one success, you're going to go through a lot of failure. You're going to go through a lot of setbacks, rejection. You're going to go through all that stuff, right? So the second thing is the resilience. It's like Rocky. Are you able to get punched like uh, 10 times and keep getting up, right? you got to have that. And the third quality would be yeah, the ability to, to innovate and be creative, to see things differently. Do you believe money can buy happiness? So I tell people that happiness is a state of mind. That if you can't learn to be happy now, 
even with 100 million, you also won't be happy. If you wanted to be happy now, could you? Yes. All you got to do is to focus on everything in your life that you're grateful for. Focus on everything in your life that you have that so many others don't have, right? And today you can have all the millions in the world and you can be depressed. How? Focus on everything that's not meeting your expectations. Because no matter where you are in life, there's always something that's not meeting your expectations, right? Mm. Just focus on everything that's wrong with your life. There's always something wrong and there's always something right. So it's what you focus on that creates that state. So it depends on the lens that you look at the world, Absolutely. right? I think many people, they feel that the meaning of life is the pursuit of happiness, you know, just go and do something which makes you happy. Yeah. What do you feel about that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, do whatever makes you happy. And like for me, you know, people ask me, why don't I buy a fancy car? By the way, I don't even own a car right now. I, I take Grab everywhere, right? They say, Adam, why are you so stingy? If all the money in the world can buy a car right now. I say, it doesn't make me happy, all right? Uh, I don't wear branded clothes. I don't do any of that thing. It doesn't make me happy. But what, ma what makes me happy is uh, spending time with my kids, uh, seeing them smile and laugh, being with my wife, making her laugh. That is what makes me happy. But that may not be what makes you happy, right? You may be happy climbing a mountain or whatever it is, right? So do what makes you happy. When I was younger, I used to believe that that was all life was about, you know, just it's the pursuit of happiness. It's going to do something which makes you happy. And then later on, I realized that a lot of the times you cannot control your happiness. You know, there's going to be some tragedy which befalls you, yeah. right? And you just have to adjust to it. And if your worldview is orientated towards happiness, sometimes it can completely crush you. Um, so I kind of like adjusted my thinking over the years to, to maybe like, what is life about? Maybe it's about purpose. And if you have some sort of purpose, it gives you meaning. I hear you mentioned family early on. To me, it's, you know, that purpose, being a father mm. for your children, being a husband for your wife. For me as well, that is also gives me a lot of significance in my life because, you know, when I started having kids, my outlook on life completely changed and I feel so, more, so much more fulfilled because I had so much more purpose. I knew that now it's my duty to be a, a good father to my children or a good husband to my wife. In fact, what I tell a lot of people is that, see, a lot of people think that I need to achieve in order to be happy. So when I buy that new car, I'll be happy. When I make that first million, I'll be happy. Is that true? Yeah, for a while, right? But the happiness doesn't last. Then once you're happy for a while, then you have to achieve another thing to be happy. So it's like a never-ending kind of thing, right? So my philosophy after that was, instead of achieving to be happy, happily achieve. That means enjoy the journey, enjoy the process, and not the outcome itself. Because when you get the outcome, that's it. You have to find another outcome, right? This is taught by a teacher, and he says something like pain and pleasure are on different sides of the same coin. Yeah. And it's sort of like the moment you have a desire for something, you kind of enter into a contract with yourself to be unhappy until you obtain that desire. <laughs> and I see that happening a lot. I think that even for a lot of entrepreneurs, right? Mm. They are always pushing themselves to succeed. Mm. And once they achieve the goal they want, the next goal. In a way, it's good because it kind of motivates them to succeed. But they are miserable all the way. Now, I thought it was something interesting that you said that yeah, there are some people where they have been conditioned or we call that they've been programmed to always be unhappy. So when, no matter what happens to them in life, they'll always find a way to be unhappy about it, right? But some people are programmed to be happy. No matter what happens, they find a way to, to to see the great side of it. And that's why in my early years, I started out by learning NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, and I trained NLP for the good part, good half of my life. Because NLP is all about rewiring yourself, reprogramming yourself. Because I was someone who at a younger age was always programmed to be unhappy. Always, always programmed to find the worst in everything. And so when I learned NLP and that transformed my mind, where now I always program myself to be happy, to find fun and enjoyment in everything, that, that changed my life. And that's why I, I taught it for many, many years. And I use it in everything. Not just in business, but in my relationships with my, my wife, my kids, and investing and, and as well. I see there's this pattern in your life where you look for things that have had a tremendous, profound impact on you, and then you try to go and put that into a course and teach other people. Yeah, yeah so that's why a lot of people ask me, you know, at first you were teaching kids, then you teach corporate adults, then you teach investing. So why do you teach all these things? Because it was through different phases of my life. Uh, you know, because I, I was a hopeless kid. I was kicked out of school at nine years old. I was called stupid, I was called dumb. And then when I proved everyone wrong, I taught my school, 
I got seven A's for O levels. I was the top one percent of NUS, and I said, "Shit!" I said, "If I can do it, other people can do it." And that's why I was passionate in teaching kids how to do it. That's why I created the courses on study skills. I wrote the book. Then later on in life, I realized that okay, I've got all the A's, but doesn't mean I can succeed in business because business requires different skills. So when I started building my business and learning how to lead people and how to motivate people, I said I want to teach that to other people as well, and that's why I started my NLP courses. Then I said, okay. You can have all the great businesses and career, but ultimately we need to learn to manage money. We need to learn how to invest intelligently. So I started to invest myself, made a lot of stupid mistakes, lost money initially, but later found out how to actually invest successfully. And then you mentioned NLP just now.、Uh, for someone who has no idea what NLP is, right? Yeah. What is one example of、uh, NLP being put into practice? Okay, NLP is basically. How you use language to program your mind,、yep. or to to program other people's mind, of course in a positive way, right? So, for example, you mentioned your father.、Yep. I'm a dad as well. If you tell your kid, "Hey, what's wrong with you?" Right, which is what a lot of parents do. "Hey, what's wrong with you?" When you say "What's wrong with you?" What are you programming their mind at a point? You're programming that something's wrong with me. And they'll keep thinking something wrong with me, something wrong with me, something wrong with me, right? That's NLP. So instead of asking them, "Hey, what's wrong with you?" Ask them, "Hey, what can you learn from this mistake you made?" Because when you ask a different question, "What can you learn?" They focus on learning something. That's NLP. It's almost like NLP is like a way to reframe all the negatives into positives using language. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in fact, reframing. Is one of the lessons in NLP. In order to be a successful entrepreneur, it's not so much having a high IQ or intellect. You just need common sense, which I think most people have. But it's more of a temperamental quality. Like I said, you need optimism, resilience, and you need to be someone who's willing to look at things from different angles. All right. So some people it comes naturally to them. Some people they are naturally optimistic. They are naturally resilient. Right. And for them, it'd be easier to be an entrepreneur. But some people are not naturally like that. Some people are, are naturally pessimistic. Or naturally, someone who gives up easily, which actually I was like that when I was young. All right. So if you're like that, could you be an entrepreneur? Can, but more difficult. And you have to train yourself to be optimistic. You have to train yourself to be resilient by going through courses, or you know, going through activities that get you out of your comfort zone to get you to shift that personality of yours. Right. So the answer to that question is: Can everyone do it? Yes. But to some people, be easier than others. Yeah, I think that because people are so different, there is also so much. Like for us, it's very easy to go and see what the external differences are between people, right? But internally, there's a tremendous amount of biological variance in everyone, and that's、mm. why people have different temperaments, right? That's why some people are introverts, some people are extroverts, right?、Mm. And if you're lucky to be born in the kind of the correct entrepreneurship combination, then it's going to be quite easy to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. But if not, you know, there's still Areas that you can work on and improve your areas, which you can improve yourself in, so that you have a higher chance to succeed as an entrepreneur. But again, why force yourself to be an entrepreneur if you're not、uh, temperamentally wired to be an entrepreneur? Because you can achieve as much success and wealth and happiness in another career that's not being an entrepreneur. Like for example, you may not be suited to be an entrepreneur, but you could be a really good, let's say,、um, manager. Like Satya Nandela, who manages Microsoft. I mean, if you think about, it, he's not really an entrepreneur. He didn't start Microsoft, but he's a very good manager, and and he's very successful, and he's very wealthy from that, right? Or a politician. A politician is not an entrepreneur, but they could be very successful. They could be very wealthy because they are very good at,、uh, again,、uh, managing things or policies, for example. So it's basically about knowing yourself and、yeah. then trying to go in. Find a job which aligns with your maybe temperament, your biological disposition. Correct. What would you say are three books that have influenced you in your life greatly? The first is Unlimited Power by Anthony Robbins. That was the book which which also had a huge impact on me. I I read it cover to cover. I think like I don't know fifty times, a hundred times. It really changed my life, and that's what introduced me to to NLP and transformative thinking and things like that. The the second book would be the essays of Warren Buffett, which is where I learned all about how Buffett invested over the years. And the third book is is called Methods of a Wall Street Master by Victor Sprandio, and that is the book that taught me about 
technical analysis, understanding market cycles and market trends and things like that. So your best-selling author of 13 books, out of the 13 books, which three do you think are the most influential and made the most impact? Definitely the first one, which is I'm Gifted, So Are You. So that's when I, I wrote that book. Most of it was written when I was in the army, actually. Uh, then it was published when I was in NUS in my second year, right? And so that's the first one. Uh, second one, very impactful, would be uh, Master Your Mind, Design Your Destiny which is my version of how I use NLP to you know, help myself change my life in business, relationships, and all that. Uh, and the third book would be Secrets of Self-Made Millionaires, uh, which is a book on uh, that combine wealth management, investing, uh, and, and the psychology of, of, of wealth. You said something very interesting just now. You wrote your book while you were in the army. Yeah. How is that even possible? I didn't sleep. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I wrote it, and I wrote it when I was uh, in OCS also. So that was quite siong, if you will, right? And, and yeah, my bunkmates were, were, thought I was crazy because every time we had spare time and all that, you know, I would be writing my book. And in those days, I was physically writing on hand. Yeah, and I competed in the army, actually. So now let's talk about the early years of your entrepreneurship. So before you were even a book writer, you know, you really were an entrepreneur of some sorts. Can you take us through that early years of you had? So I started my first business at 15. Uh, that was my mobile disco business, uh, which basically consisted of a big, uh, we call it a coffin, with two turntables and a mixer and two helicopter lights and a smoke machine. And I'll go around uh, selling my services to do parties for people. So I did a lot of birthday parties. So. Uh, families would invite me, then we would charge in those days $300 a night, right? And we will set up the lights, the music, the smoke machine, and we'll, we'll do the disco party there. I have to say that it's not very usual for a 15 year old to go and start thinking of a, like a hustle like this, right? Yeah. Like what, you know, why did we were even in that frame of mind? Since I was young, I always thought of ways to make money. Okay. Uh, one reason was because my parents would not give me more money uh, they only gave me the basics. My parents only gave me enough money for food and water, that's it. And any extra, they said, you have to buy it yourself. You have to find a way to make it yourself. And that's why I'm now bringing my two daughters up the same way. It's like we give them enough for food, transport, anything else, you go and earn yourself. That's why my two daughters are also working. So it's the same thing that I learned as well. So in, in my younger days, I was very obsessed with computer games. Atari, Nintendo. I always wanted to buy the latest games. I was very obsessed with music. I always wanted to buy the latest albums from Michael Jackson, Madonna. And I love to also buy Star Wars and uh, Mars collectibles. But I didn't have any money, right? Because my parents won't give me the money. So the only way was go make money. So that's why since I was 13 years old, 14, I would go out to start making money. So I did a lot of part-time jobs. I started uh, doing door-to-door -door sales, uh, direct selling, selling stationery for my friend's father who owned a stationery shop. Then I became a part-time roadie for an event management company. Roadie means you carry speakers, you, you help to set up the lighting systems and all that. And that was where I learned the business of event management, working as a roadie. Then they gave me uh, a job as a DJ for a while. So I, I learned from a company basically, right? Yeah. So once I got all that skills then, I saved up $2,000. And with that two grand, I bought my first mobile disco second-hand system. What do you think about the generation of parents today? I think a lot of parents, they, they feel that maybe that, you know, when I was young, I didn't have this in life. Therefore, I want to go and give my kids all of these. I see your approach is very different. It's almost like the opposite because yeah. you've learned that maybe by depriving your kids of certain things, you teach them other values instead. Yeah. Do you think that's the better way to go about parenting? You see, most parents I talk to, what do they all say? I want my kids to be motivated, right? Mm. Yeah, we all want that. But the best way to kill their motivation is to give them what they want. If you give them what they want, what more motivation is there? There's no more motivation. Motivation comes when you want something you don't have. Right? So, you know, my dad treated me this way, which I thought was great. You know, I mean, when I was young, of course, I didn't like it. I thought he's a bloody stingy bugger. But as I grew older, I really appreciated it. That if he gave me whatever I wanted, 
I wouldn't be where I am today. So after your mobile disco yeah. business, right, what was the next step for you? Okay, so the mobile disco business, I did it all the way to army. Then army, I stopped and I restarted in uni. In university, they have what we call jam and hop. They have got uh, the they are so called their prom night and all that. So I did most of it. I did for NUS. I did for NTU. I sapu all the business. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Now, in addition, then I started doing training, mm. right? So I attended a motivational course and that's what really helped me to change my, my life. And I went back to become a volunteer for that course, for my mentor, teaching kids about study skills and all that. So when I was in NUS first year, I created my own study skills program. And I remember that the first place I went back to was Victoria JC, mm. which is my, my JC, right? And I did a, a two hour preview I, I spoke to the principal, I, I did a two-hour preview. There were, I think like 400 kids in the auditorium. And I told them, I said, hey, you know what? I scored straight A's for A-levels. If you want to score straight A's for A-levels, I can teach you how to do it in a two-day program, right? And I charged $100, I remember. We had over 200 signups. $100 per student? Per or? student for two days. I had about uh, 200 signups. So I made 20,000 in two days. Right. And you were how old this? I was NUS first year, right? So that's when I realized, wow, that's not bad, right? So that's how I started doing all that. So, Adam, you became a self-made millionaire at 26 years old, right? And that was maybe what a lot of people knew you for at, for at the start, right, of the journey. Can you tell us a bit about that? Because early on, you mentioned that when you were nine years old, mm. you went through a camp and that was kind of like the catalyst for your transformation from turning into like a dropout into a star student. Mm. So tell us through that whole process. Actually, I was 13 years old okay. that I went to that camp. Yeah, so my my dad sent me to the camp uh, and he, he, he loves to tell people this. He said it was not out of inspiration that I wanted Adam to be great. It was out of desperation <laughs> okay. to make sure that at least he won't end up in jail, right? Or end up on the streets. Lah. So. So yeah, I went to that camp and it really, really changed my life because it taught me how to believe in myself. Because early on, I used to have all this negative thought that if other people can do it, I cannot. You know, right? That people are better than me, people are smarter than me. Then, I mean, I come from a broken family. Uh, my parents divorced and they both remarried. And I stayed with my dad who remarried uh, his wife who had a daughter from her previous marriage and she became my stepsister and she was in RGS gifted program and I was in neighborhood school bottom right so you know I felt like an idiot right so when I went to this uh, course called super teen at the time you know one my mentor told me he said you know Adam if your your stepsister can be in a gifted program so can you right if, if she can be a genius so can you I say oh really yeah. <laughs> okay so in a way it was good because I was very really naive you know I said oh I really can all right and I, I, I had an open mind. So I started learning, you know, all these tools at that time, like mind mapping and learning all these memory skills and learning about NLP, how to talk to myself positively. And one of the things that we did was we create, we learned to set goals. We create what we call a vision board, where we draw a vision for the future, right? And I set the goal that I want to top my school, I want to go to NUS, be the top in NUS, I wrote all the goal, I want to write a book. So everything was written out at 13 years old. The entire life plan was written out. And one of that was to make my first million at 26 years old. And one reason was because the book Anthony Robbins, Unlimited Power, uh, he became a millionaire at 24. And if you recall, Anthony Robbins was a janitor. So when I read that book, I said, if he did it at 24, I can only do it at 26. Because NS, National Service, two more years old. Uh, yeah. So that's how it came out, okay. the 26 figure, right? Okay. Yeah. And so after that, I, I did whatever I could to find a way to make money, right? So it's a combination of um, the, 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 the trainings I, I did. And that was the most lucrative, honestly. I made like 20 grand in two days and I did a lot of those, right? And then uh, my mobile disco business was going on and I started investing. And uh, in a way, I was very lucky because that was the dot-com boom, if you recall. 97, 98, 99. 99, I was about 26 years old. So that was really when the market was really taking off. So in a way, it was a bit of luck as well. Uh, that whatever I made, I put it into the markets and I made a lot. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, your mentor early on. Can you tell me a bit about your mentor, the impact that he had on you? Yeah, huge impact. So his name is Ernest Wong. Uh, he, he's a Malaysian. 
and he came to Singapore to start this program. Actually, he was really running the program in Malaysia, but he uh, brought it to Singapore. And I was one of his early students. Um, so yeah, he, he had a huge impact uh, because he was unlike any trainer I had met. Um, because, you know, most teachers are very serious. They stand on stage and they lecture and it's like very serious, very boring. So he was like, you know, dynamic and he made you laugh and he made you entertain and he... So that is what... Um, that's what I model after a lot. So it made the education journey interesting, engaging. Yeah, I've never met a teacher that can make me laugh, make me cry and make me change my life. You know, and yeah, so his, he was my first model. We'll get to the laughing yeah, and crying and, bit. And, and, yeah, and the, and the second model was of, of course Tony Robbins, yeah. uh, where I attended a lot of his courses. I watched a lot of his videos and again, how, how does this guy get a room of thousands yeah. to shift their thoughts, to shift their emotions through his language, his, his, his tonality, his facial expression? I do feel like even people like Tony Robbins, they get a fair bit of skeptics and detractors <laughs> yeah. and... You know, whenever I see that happen, I'm quite puzzled just because of the impact that Tony Robbins had on my life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, Tony and Ernest changed my life. Without them, today I'll be a bum on the streets. Okay, Adam, let's go back to that 13-year-old Adam, okay, when you are sent for that transformation camp. Are there any core memories that you have that you had there which transformed you? There were some kids, they were sent to the camp that say, I don't want to go, right? So they were literally forced to go. Then some kids were like, I want to go on to change my life, right? I was in the center, I was like, whatever. La. You change, change, don't change, don't la. go. La. Okay. So I went with no expectations. I went with a very, in Malay, you know, tidapa attitude, la, right? Mm. And so I think one of the things that really shifted me was um, we had a session where we call it future pacing. He got us to see the future where we close our eyes and then we, we dim the lights and all that. And then he got us to visualize that if you continue to do what you're doing now, continue to be lazy, don't work hard, where will you be in five years? Where will you be in 10 years? He got us to visualize. And how your parents feel about your actions today, when you talk back at them, when you're rude to them, uh, and disappoint them, right? So when we went through a century, we cry, oh, you know, really, really hit me a lot, you know, because I was, I was not very nice to my parents at that time. Lah. I was not close to my mom or my dad at all. You know, I, in fact, I would bully my mom. I would like shout at her, I don't want this and all that. And I was not close to my dad as well. But uh, from that session, I really realized how much parents do for us. You know, and, and that's what really made us very close after that. And that's what made me, in a way, very guilty that I've been wasting my life up to that point. So I said, from now on, I'm going to do the best I can do. I'm going to work really hard and I'm going to make them proud. So one of the things that we do in the course, after we set the goals, right? Yeah. On the last day when the parents come for the graduation, we declare the goals to the parents in front of everyone. So I remember I stood up, there was about, I think like 80 people in the room. And I declared to my mom and my dad that I will achieve all these goals. I'll go to NUS, I'll, I'll be successful and all that. And once you do that, a bit hard to go back. Yeah. yeah, because one of the things that we learn is that you got to make a public commitment. Right, that when you make a public commitment, you have no choice. You can't back out anymore. Let's go back again to this, you know, um, training programs that you have, you did with uh, in schools, right? Do you think there would be value to go and create different sort of programs for different groups of people? Yeah, and that's why one of the things that we do is this uh, personality profiling, right? So we do MBTI, we do DISC, and we do this thing called tetra mapping, which are three different approaches to personalities. Right. So MBTI, a lot of people are aware, which is the MBTI is the introvert versus extrovert, sensor, intuitor, judger, perceiver. So we, ha we, in we have integrated a lot of this personality profiling in our courses. So then the kids understand, oh, I'm more of this type of personality. I'm actually a very high introvert. I'm a very high introvert. It, the MBTI, the profiling has a level. Mm. I'm an extremely high introvert. But in my career, I force myself to be an extrovert. But my nature is an introvert. That's why I don't really like parties. I don't like networking that much. I hate it actually. That's why Patrick does it. Patrick's a super extrovert. I'm a super introvert. I like to be by myself. At the most, I like to be with one or two people. I don't have many friends actually. I've got very few friends but very deep relationships. You know? So, what I'm saying is that through the personality profiling, if you find that you're introvert, 
it doesn't mean you can't be a speaker. It doesn't mean you can't be an entrepreneur. It just means that you have to know who you are, but leverage on that. And at the same time, learn to develop those areas you're not strong at. So I noticed a theme of transformation right in all the motivational camps. What do you think are the keys to unlocking transformation in people? Because I, I think, you know, as people reach a certain age, it becomes more and more difficult. And then you have also mentioned, you know, when you were a kid, you know, you weren't sure and you're quite impressionable. Yeah. Right? So do you think it's still, let's say we want to unlock transformation in the workplace because mm. I think a lot of the trouble which some companies have is they want to try and maybe motivate and get the best out of their employees. But sometimes it's not always so easy. Mm. What do you feel are the keys to unlocking transformation? I don't think it's a question of age. Um, again, I sometimes you'd be surprised. Some people, because they've gone through so much in life, in their 40s, they have a greater need for change than someone who's younger and feel that I don't need to change because I don't have that much baggage to shift. But on the other hand, you could say that someone who's younger, who's a bit more naive, could be easier to have a shift. So there are pros and cons to ages. But I'll say in order to create any kind of transformation, the number one thing is that person has to want to change. You can't make someone change. You can create the environment to give the person the opportunity, but they have to want to change. So, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, when I did a lot of this training, people say, oh, Adam, you know, you changed that guy. You, can you change me? And the first thing I say is, I can't change anyone. I can't change you. Only you can change you. I can only give you the tools to change yourself. Right, so I think that's the first thing. That's a great point, Adam, but okay, so how do you then get people to want to change? So there are a few things we work on, right? The first thing are their belief systems. So the first thing is to get them to recognize what are their current beliefs right now and how are their beliefs affecting their life? How is it affecting their relationships? How is it affecting their wealth and all that? What, the limiting beliefs, right? And then showing them what are more empowering beliefs that could get them to see things differently, to get them to behave differently. So first thing we work on are the belief systems. Then the second thing we work on are the value systems, which you know Anthony Robbins is very much in line, right? With the values are why you do what you do. What are your compelling reasons, you know? Like some people are driven more by recognition. Some people are driven more by freedom. Some people are driven more by security. So what is your why, you know? So for me, at the early stage of my life, my strong why was recognition. I wanted to be someone. I wanted to be um, someone important, you know. But as you grow older, your values change. So now to me, being recognized and important is not that important anymore, right? But so to me now, what's more important is uh, about uh, relationships. It's about uh, contribution. It's about freedom, you know. So they have to know their why. Then... Then the third thing is to set very clear goals about what they want. Once they have the right beliefs, the right values, then it's about the goals. So these are the three main things we work on. So I imagine it's going to be quite difficult for a manager to have this conversation with an employee, like, you know, doing the performance review. By the way, these are the things you have to focus on. Like, you know, how will you advise maybe managers in the workplace who want to try and empower the employees, you know, have them undergo that transformation? so that they can become the best versions of themselves. Okay, if you ask me in a corporate setting, um, there was a book written many years ago. I'm trying to recall the name of the book. I think, it's, I think the book is called From Good to Great, if I'm not wrong, right? And one of the things he said was that as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a business leader, you have to get, get the right people on the bus. You have to get the right people on the bus and then decide where to take the bus. So the first thing is you have to get the right people on the bus. So it's back to what my father taught me years ago, that if you have to motivate someone that you hired, you hired the wrong person. If you have to manage someone, you hired the wrong guy. So I think the first job is you have to recruit the right kind of people who are self-motivated, okay, who are self-driven, yeah. Yeah, and then you give them the opportunity to do what they do. But I would say that it would be the ideal scenario, right? In reality, kind of people sometimes make mistakes. We don't get the right people on the bus. In that then, case, then, how then, do we then, turn? then change them? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have to you have to change them. As in, you have to you have to fire them and replace them with someone who's motivated, right? I mean, as a business person, that's what I do. I'll say that that would be probably kind of like a last resort, right? Yeah. Are there things that you go and do to go and help transform them, or is it too difficult? Okay. So to me, uh, I. I... I mean, over the years, I, I've been very blessed because my, my employees, you know, 
I can't remember the actual statistics, but if I'm not wrong, something like about 50% of my staff have been with us for more than 10 years. I can't remember exact statistics, but it's very, very high. Mm. Most of my guys have been with me forever. There are a few things that motivate people in their job, mm. right? Number one, when they feel that what they do is contributing to make a better world, right? So a lot of my people, they, they, they continue to be in my company because they realize that what we do is helping people, helping kids become better, helping people become better investors. So they, they see that by working, it's not just getting a paycheck, they're actually making the world better. So that's what motivates them, number one. Number two is the empowerment. That when they come to the company, they, are, they feel empowered to make their own decisions. And that's what motivates them. But if you keep telling them what to do and you keep on controlling them, they have no motivation, right? So that's the second thing. The third thing is, of course, compensation. Okay, that the way we compensate is a lot based on performance. If they perform well and the business does well, they get very well compensated, right? So that they all feel like a shareholder. In fact, a lot of them are shareholders as well, right? At one stage, we actually sold shares to them. So Adam, you are a product of the Singapore education system, right? You've graduated top 1% from NUS, right? And you're also on the Pioneer Scholar Program. Mm. Um, and, you know, when I look at all these causes which are being taught outside of schools, I feel these are actually very important because they are enrichment causes. It's almost like they are causes which are taught to supplement the learning that people have in schools, right? Yeah. In school, you have the base learning, and then you have all the extra stuff about life that is that are important for people to know. Personally, I would change quite a few things, you know, if I, if I could change some things about the education system. I'm curious, you know, is there anything that you would like to change? Well, when I was going through school, if you ask me this question, I'll say there's a lot of things I want to change. And one of the things I want to change is to make things more practical, right? Remember that in my day when I was in NUS, it was very theoretical. Everything we learned was very theoretical. There was no practical applications. But the good news is nowadays, it's very different. Nowadays, there's a lot of project work, there are internships, there's uh, real-life practitioners teaching in the university. So I would say it's being done right now. I remember when I was in VJC, I was the president of the Economic Society. And what happened was, during Valentine's Day, I came up with this idea to set up a booth and sell roses to make money for the society. And I was pulled aside and reprimanded by the principal and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to make some money, right? And not for me, for the society. No, you can't. You cannot charge money, right? So it was, it was very strange, right? Now, if you did it today, it's fine because nowadays schools are promoting entrepreneurship, right? They want students to be entrepreneurs. But in my day, it was frowned upon. And even not too long ago, I remember that when I was training kids in schools, the moment I mentioned anything about money, that, hey guys, if you work hard, you can get a job, you can make good money, the teachers would get upset. Adam, don't mention money, right? It's a taboo topic. I said, it doesn't make sense. Money is a taboo topic. It's a taboo topic in schools. Maybe not now, but as early back as six years ago when I was still personally training in schools. I was not allowed to talk about money. And when I mentioned that, oh, I made my first million at 26, the teachers were very upset. You're teaching the kids the wrong values. They should not do things from money. They should do things because of society, which, which is true, correct. But you sh like it or not, money is still important. You still need to have a financial metric, right? So you created a series of school workshops based on your best-selling book, right? I Am yeah. Gifted, So Are You. Mm. Can you take me through your highs and lows of being a youth educator? The highest points are always the appreciation that you get, right? Right after the camp, they come up to you and say, you, you changed my life, you know, I have this breakthrough. And we had so many instances because on the last day, we always invite the parents to come. And we have had really touching moments when, for example, this daughter didn't talk to the dad for one year. And that during that graduation, when the dad came, she went over and hugged the dad and said, I'm sorry. And, you know, that's really the highest point. She felt but, guilty for, to her father. Yeah. And I tell you what's even more fantastic is that um, we've had students who attended the course, they become parents ready, and they send their kids to our course. And we see the entire cycle come back. Lowest points, I would say, you can't save everyone, right? And in a camp of 50 or 100 people, you know, they are, you, know you, you say the same thing, you put them through the same experience, but there are some people at the end of it will just say, I'm sorry, but I don't buy what you're saying, you know? And, and to me, it's fine because you paid the same money as the other guy, mm. but I feel so sad that you walked away and you missed that 
that experience. You miss that ability to change your life. And I'm hoping that maybe they'll meet someone else who can change their life. Maybe they will, I hope so. But what I tell myself, maybe to console myself, is that there's an old saying, right? When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. That maybe all of us will come to a point of time where our life will change. But we meet that person at different points. So maybe I was not meant to be that teacher to change that person's life. I was not meant to be. But there'll be someone else when he's ready or when she's ready. So Alan, the market is such that a lot of times people do not know who is legitimate and credible hmm. and who isn't because it's very hard for a normal person to distinguish, right? Yeah. So how would someone be able to tell who is a real guru with valuable advice that they could offer that might change someone's life as compared to someone who is just a fake guru and shooting their course but they don't really know much about the subject and you're not going to learn much from them? So I'll say the first thing is to look at track record, okay? Um, does the person have a track record? And there are some people who they can make a lot of money because they bought a certain one stock or a few stocks for a short period of time. And I always say that in the short term, when the market is going up, everyone looks like a genius. In the short term, you can make a lot of money in the markets purely by luck. And there are people who do that purely by luck or purely through a gambling instinct. And then they start teaching investing, which becomes then very dangerous. Because when they teach the wrong things and people learn, and when the market comes down, they could lose a lot of money, right? So you have to look at people with a track record, not just in one year, two years, but over the long term, right? And it's very interesting because, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years. I've been investing now for 30 years and teaching investing since 2005. That's when I started the Wealth Academy Investor Masterclass. So I've been teaching this for 18 years. And throughout the 18 years, you can see what we call bull and bear cycle. Bull cycles of market goes up, then collapses goes up. So I've been through a lot of those ups and downs. And you find that every time during a bull cycle, a lot of these new gurus will come out. Oh, I can make millions, all right? Right, during a bull cycle, everyone's a genius, right? Then in a bear market, a lot of them will disappear. They would all collapse. And then the new bull market, a new set of gurus will come up, then collapse. And the cycle repeats, right? So you got to see that over a period, over at least 10, 15 years, who are those people who are still there? And not many. You can count with one hand. So, so that's the first thing. That, that, that long-term... Uh, longevity. Longevity of that person teaching uh, the courses. And of course, their, their personal performance track record, which I, I put online, in fact. In fact, every six months, I put my own trading records online. They can see for themselves. Right, uh, the returns that I make and things like that. So that's one way. What are some other ways? The second way is watch their videos, the, the free ones first, right? And there are a few clues when you know that someone is full of crap, okay? When someone says that I can predict, I can predict the market will go up, full of crap. No one can predict. If you watch any of my videos, I always say that no one can predict the stock market. I can't predict the stock market. All I can do is to look at probabilities based on market trends, based on market cycles. Is it probable to go up or go down? It's a probability, just like professional poker playing, which you used to do, right? Mm. But no one can predict, okay? So the moment someone says, I can predict the stock, it's a fake, all right? Or if someone says, I can predict where the market is going, it's also a fake. So it's not like teaching people how to understand rather than just giving them a shortcut and a kind of a prediction. Yeah, correct. Yeah. But I would say that people don't really want to understand, they just want the shortcut, you know, they want it fast. Which doesn't happen in real life, okay? And, I, I, and the other thing is this, right? The moment someone tells you you can get rich fast with no risk, it's a scam. There, there's, no, there's no such thing in life. There's, there's no get rich quick method, at least not sustainable, right? Yeah, you can get rich quick through making a gamble and all that, but eventually you're gonna lose everything. So Adam, who are some people that you look up to in this community? Not many. I would name a few channels. One would be Joseph Carlson. Uh, he's American-based. Another is Ken Fisher, who is a very successful investor. I think he's in his 70s now. And locally, I would say the, the fifth person, right? And the sad thing is that these three channels, which I think are some of the most credible, some of the best content, they don't have many views. Speaking of track records, Adam, what is your own performance like compared to the index? So I've been beating the index pretty consistently over time. Uh, so for example, the last five years, I'm up about 123%, uh, which I just posted on my YouTube and my Facebook channel versus the S&P, which is yeah, a lot lower than that. And if you look at the last five years, we went through a bear market, 
We went through a recession, banking crisis, pandemic, but I still managed to more than double my account uh, and beat the S&P 500. In fact, first six months this year, I'm up $1.4 million in, in profits. Fantastic. So apart from the finance community, right, who are some people that you also look towards to as mentors, you know, outside of finance? I would say people like your Anthony Robbins again. I, I don't have that many, but it's the few that I really follow uh, religiously, if you will, right? Your Anthony Robbins, the other guys, you know, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger. And the thing about Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger is a lot of what I follow is not just their investing wisdom, but it's their life principles, the way they live their life. Uh, where they are very simple people, they're very frugal people, and they focus a lot on relationships. So Adam, let's talk a bit about your future plans, right? So what is your current involvement in your business? Actually, for many years now, I would say for the last six or seven years, uh, my business runs very much by itself, all right? Um, so my partner, Patrick, who's a CEO, he actually runs the, the, the business, the management part of it. So in fact, I don't get involved in the management meetings. I don't get involved in the strategic planning meetings. He manages everything. Um, you know, he, he sets the goals, the KPIs, he manages the entire team, right? So for me, I just focus on what I love doing, which is investing and also investing the company funds. And I focus on managing my student community because once people join my program, they are in my community. We have got a Discord channel, which is seven days a week, 18 hours a day. So anytime they've got questions, they ask and we share. So I spend most of my time on that. So Adam, how often do you speak a year? Oh, now, I only teach four times a year now. And I do it online, Zoom, four times a year. I was so surprised, you know, when we came to your office, I was yeah. expecting a lot of conference rooms, but you know, I heard that you've completely moved digitally online. Yeah. yeah how's right. that transition been for you? So what happened was, uh, in 2016, I started to put my curriculum online. Uh, so we started in 2016. And so from 2016 to 2019, it was very slow, right? Most of my teachings were still offline, were still physical, right? To give you an idea, before COVID, I was traveling to at least three cities every week. I was in Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia. I was all over the place and I was, I was on stage almost every day. Um, and I only ate dinner with my family once a week if I was, if I was lucky uh, because everything was physical, right? Then when COVID hit and everything shut down, uh, people all trapped at home and they had a lot of time to watch things online. And that's when our online business took off, right? And it was pretty amazing because before COVID, online only made up 10% of our business. And right after COVID is now 90%. So it totally transformed the business. And, and during COVID, of course, I couldn't, I couldn't travel anymore, right? So I started doing everything on Zoom and I started teaching on Zoom. And then it became so successful because when I taught physically in Singapore, I could only have Singaporeans. When I taught in Malaysia, only Malaysians. But now I teach on Zoom, I've got people from over 138 countries attending my Zoom training. And I thought to myself, why didn't I do this earlier? And the answer is I couldn't. Because of COVID, it changed people's mentality that we can learn online. Before that, it was the technology was there, but people were not as incentivized. So yeah, COVID really transformed not just my business, but my lifestyle. So after COVID, I realized that I'm never going to go back to my old um, routine of traveling around the world and hardly spending time with my family because family is the most important thing to me. So because of that, now I'm 100% in my family and then I can you know, reach the same number of people as I did. Well, more people. But at home, in fact, more people now at home and doing it four times. What are some trends in the world that you're carefully watching now? I don't really look at trends when it comes to investing because my approach to investing is I don't take a macro view to investing like some people do. I take a very micro view. So I look at individual businesses and some of the best investments I made are in very traditional, boring, non-trendy businesses. Like for example, one of the best investments I made that I made a lot of my in, in, money in is in McDonald's. All right. Now, McDonald's is not an exciting business. It's not a trendy business. It's been around for, you know, uh, what, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years. But it's something that we eat very often. I just had McDonald's for lunch just now. So I, I invest in things that are predictable, that are 
uh, consistent. So it looks like there are several major chapters in your life, right? The first chapter was you as a young entrepreneur with your disco business. And after that, you became a youth educator. Right? And then you became, um, well, a motivational speaker. And now you're dabbling in, or not say dabbling, and now you do finance full-time as an investor. What do you think like the next chapter of your life looks like? Actually, I think this is my last chapter. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm reaching 50 and this is probably what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. So I see myself, number one is a family man right now. Spending a lot of time with my two kids while they are still growing up. And a lot of time with my aged parents and aged in-laws. They are actually, uh, me and my wife actually have to spend a lot of time with them because of certain uh, medical issues. So we actually spending a lot of time with our, our agent parents. And I think this goes back to you know, one of the first conversations we talked about, right? And kind of like, what point do you stop, right? But if you just kind of enjoy the process all the way, yeah. then that's when people get fulfillment. Okay, so Adam, so we're going to end this with a series of rapid fire questions. Okay, I sure. want you to just think of the first word which comes to your mind when I say certain keywords. Let's start with love. Family. Hero. Parents. Stocks. Businesses. Guru Tony Robbins Education Necessity Entrepreneurship um, Fun Singapore uh, Home So um, Adam, any final word to the camera? Where if people want to follow more about what you do, where should they follow you on? Are you on Threads? Yes, I would say I'm one of the first Singaporeans on Threads and being a Meta shareholder, I shamelessly uh, promoted threads on my Facebook, YouTube, and uh, Twitter accounts. So yeah, I'm on threads. You can find me on threads, but I'm the most active on Facebook. But be careful about the Adam Koo fake impersonator pages. Make sure you get the Adam Koo, the blue tick. Okay, and that's all we have for today. Thank you so much, Adam, you know, for joining us on this podcast. So thanks for tuning in on this episode of Hatch & Hustle. If you enjoy our content, please like and share this video and subscribe to us. It was a great time having Adam on the show. And yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in. Bye-bye. Yeah. Hey Adam, just now I saw you prepare the mind map for this interview. Huh? Yeah, just simple key points. Yeah. <laughs> Can you show us the mind map? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There you go.